This is the 15th meeting of criminal law. We will complete our coverage of the homicide offenses with a look at the felony murder rule. The classic statement of the rule is found in Sir James Fitzjames Stevens' charge to the jury in the case of Regina versus Cernay. Judge Stevens explains the kind of culpability the prosecution must prove to convict the accused of the crime of murder. Malice aforethought. The words malice aforethought are technical, he warns the jury. Not only are the words technical, the technical term can be satisfied in several ways. He goes on to focus on two particular meanings that malice aforethought has. One of those meanings is the killing of another person by an act done with intent to commit a felony. Another meaning is an act done with the knowledge that the act will probably cause the death of some person. The two meanings are distinct. The second meaning requires the prosecution to show that the defendant believed that his act would cost the life of a person. The first does not require that. All that it requires is that the accused intended to commit some other felony and that the felonious act happened to cause a person's death. There was some evidence that the defendant, Cerne, intended the death of his son, but a jury might harbor a doubt about that. A jury might find it reasonably possible that the son's death was an unintended consequence of a botched insurance fraud. That fraud involved arson, a felony. There was overwhelming evidence that the defendant had committed arson and uncontroverted evidence that the deceased had perished in the resulting fire. Under the first instruction, the jury would be authorized to convict Cernay even if it doubted that Cernay had counted upon the death of his son. The first instruction conveys what we have come to know as the felony murder rule. It has been abrogated by statute in the United Kingdom, but it survives in many American jurisdictions. The felony in the felony murder rule is, of course, some felony other than the murder itself. We can refer to this other felony as the predicate felony. In Regina versus Cerne, it is arson. In the understanding of the rule that had come down traditionally, the predicate felony might be any felony whatever. In the words of the eminent Sir Edward Cook's Institutes of the Laws of England, published in the 17th century, if the act be unlawful, it is murder. The implications of Cook's simple formula can be illustrated this way. We ask, if the defendant's arrow kills a hidden victim, Cook's test counts which as murder. A. The defendant was aiming at a deer in the defendant's own park. B. The defendant was aiming at a deer in somebody else's park, where he wasn't supposed to be. C. The defendant aims at a wild fowl in the commons, where everyone is free to come and go. And D. The defendant aims at a tame fowl in the commons. Which? There is no predicate felony in case A, the defendant is hunting on his own estate. But in case B, the defendant is poaching, a felony. In case C, a wild fowl is for the taking. But in case D, the tame fowl is not for the taking and the defendant again commits a felony. So the defendants in cases B and D can be found guilty of murder, even though they exercised all care while hunting. Think of it another way. The only culpability that need be shown, according to Cook, is the culpability needed to prove the predicate felony. No culpability need be shown as to the resulting death. 
Applying that rule to Cernay's case would mean the jury had to find the defendant culpable as to the arson, but not as to the resulting death. But wait! This rule is inconsistent with the principles we've seen at work in our earlier cases. In Cunningham, the prosecution had to show culpability as to the resulting endangerment. And in Faulkner, culpability had to be shown as to the resulting fire to convict the defendant of arson on top of larceny. Why the difference? The answer is that it is because somebody dies. No one had died as a result of the predicate felonies in Cunningham and in Faulkner. Had someone died, Cook would count the cases as murder, regardless of other evidence of culpability. If the act be unlawful, it is murder. Judge Stephen disagrees. Cook's statement is too broad for him. Judge Stephen offers illustrations like these. We ask, which of these cases would Judge Stephen count as murder? A. The defendant detonates a bomb to facilitate a prison break. B. The defendant squeezes his rape victim by the throat. C. The defendant pickpockets a weak-hearted victim. D. Defendant pickpockets a victim carrying a loaded pistol with a safety off. Now, Cook would count all of these cases as felony murder, but Stephen would count only cases A and B. How should Cook's rule be qualified? Judge Stephen says, instead of saying any act done with intent to commit a felony, say, any act known to be dangerous to life and likely in itself to cause death, done with intent to commit a felony, which causes death. And where he says act known to be dangerous to life, he means known to the law to be dangerous, whether the defendant knows it or not. Judge Stevens' restricted formulation of the felony murder rule has come to be known as the requirement that the facts show the defendant committed or attempted an inherently dangerous felony. Mm -hmm.